In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Mammon may refer to a Syrian god of wealth, or it may just be wealth itself. It doesn't matter really. We need to hate it, or him, or is it her? Hate it. That's what it says. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold on to the one and despise the other. Take your pick. Maybe there's a bit of Semitic rhetoric going on here. When it says elsewhere, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated, I'm not sure it means literally that God hated Esau. And when our Lord, shockingly to our eyes, says, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Here we're surely in the realms of manner of speech. Or perhaps we've gone for the wrong religion. And indeed, the Bible scholars tell us as much. It's a way of saying, a graphic way of saying, that our love for God must come first. Or perhaps, it it usurps the true God. So we must love our children as children, not as gods. We must treat mammon not as a god to be worshipped and to be the goal of our lives, but secondary, lovely maybe, as lovely as the lilies of the field, but not to be sought in itself and for itself. Wealth, money, food, drink, clothes, may be a beautiful servant, but it is a dangerous and tyrannical master. Perhaps that's why our Lord didn't trust his disciples as individuals to control money, but insisted they share a common purse, a discipline that continued into the early church in Jerusalem and continues, of course, in religious monastic communities today. The one who is entrusted with the purse strings for our Lord's band of disciples was significantly, perhaps, the one who was snared and fell, Judas. The Sermon on the Mount has nothing on the dangers of sex, but everything on the danger of personal wealth. At the very least, he is arguing this, perhaps shocking us into being aware of it. We're being challenged to answer the question, what are you looking for in life? For the Gentiles, the nations, the Roman and other empires, he says they are looking for wealth, food, drink, clothes. These are the things that matter to people. It's what they pursue. But you, he says to his disciples, you must look elsewhere. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And you can have the food and the drink and the clothes as well. But the things of God, the rule of God, the justice of God, must come first. 
One man who lived this out was the missionary bishop of Melanesia, John Coleridge Patterson, who is commemorated in the church's calendar today. Patterson was a pioneering evangelist. He learned 24 of the 96 languages of Melanesia in order to share the faith with them. He traveled amongst them tirelessly. He was known for the warmth of his personality and his lack of Episcopal pomp. A fellow missionary, a Presbyterian, described him as a man of the most lovely Christian character and singular devotedness. He was known for his fresh attitude to missionary work, questioning the Victorian assumptions of cultural assimilation. He loved and valued indigenous cultures, generations before it became fashionable to do so. And when they were usually condemned by European missionaries. He wrote, I have for years thought that we seek in our missions a great deal too much to make English Christians of our converts. We consciously and unanimously assume English Christianity to be essential. One mistake of this kind, he said, was to suppose clothing essential. Hence, missionaries had sought to cover up their charges native nakedness, much as early generations had painted fig leaves on Renaissance de depictions of Adam and Eve. But perhaps here we could take literally the words of the Lord. Why take thought for raiment? Why bother about clothing? Bishop Patterson might have quoted it. I have researchers enough to find out whether he did. We often worry about the penultimate things. The Melanesians proved to be good Christians, and they still are. The Melanesian Brotherhood and other sister religious orders are amongst the most thriving religious communities in the Anglican Communion. And they keep a common purpose. They have nothing of their own. They are Sermon on the Mount Christians. They represent a vibrant form of Christianity that is true to the Catholic faith brought to them, as well as to their own indigenous culture. Patterson's own life ended tragically. On this day, in 1871, he and two companions were killed when they landed on the Carpal Island, Patterson being clubbed to death, the others killed with arrows. It was probably a revenge killing after a group of men and boys from the island had been kidnapped and taken into slavery. His death, tragic though it was, led to his greater fame as a martyr back here and caused such a stir that the cause of Aboriginals was much promoted. The abolition of slavery in those parts hastened by British action. Patterson was as riveted by the message of the Sermon on the Mount as the first hearers were. They too, many of them, gave their lives in the cause of the kingdom that they had been taught to seek above all things. They too, like Bishop Patterson, knew they were the blessed ones. Blessed precisely because they did not seek riches or material prosperity, but had a greater vision, a life-giving one. A vision that they could see could transform the world. And in some places, that vision is continuing to do precisely that. <laughs>